Well, um, I was just thinking that Rochelle has come so far to visit us and she's not able to sit in with us because, oh, there she is, there you go. Great, great. I realize the challenges that uh, a new child can bring. We've gone through that ourselves. Great blessing and uh, a great challenge. But I'm hoping that uh, we don't finish, since we're running a little bit later from the report of Presbytery, that we don't uh, miss out on our time to be able to fellowship with Rochelle and, and to be able to see what the Lord has blessed them with. So we may have to move the prayer meeting uh, up maybe just a little bit, uh, or back I guess is perhaps the right term, so that we do have that time. So just bear that in mind. But let's turn in our Bibles now, uh, not to the text that I have listed there, the 1 John 3.24, although I will make reference to that, but rather to 1 John chapter 4, verse 13, if you want to uh, follow along. I'm just really going to read one verse, so perhaps it might be best just to listen. Uh, this, this kind of a, a series tends to be more topical than, than simply sticking to one text. We're going to be moving around into different areas. Uh, so you may open if you would like, but please do listen carefully as I read this. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, John writes in 1 John chapter 4, verse 13, By this we know that we abide in Him, and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. Now, this evening we do want to look at the witness of the Spirit, and what that means really, again, that's, that's a very broad subject. Every evidence of salvation is a witness of the Spirit, but we want to focus on the internal witness of the Spirit, some of the specifics that he does outside of, the, of what we usually consider as that transformation of life, <clears throat> which we actually <clears throat> began to consider last week. As John told us that a true believer is one who walks in the light. And remember what that means, of course, is walking according to God's truth, walking according to his law, walking in the light of truth and holiness. Uh, last week we saw that uh, a believer walking in the truth knows God's truth, loves that truth, and lives according to that truth. And the reason why a Christian would do that, a reason, reason why a believer would do that, is because God is light. Because God is absolute truth. God believes the truth. There is no lie in Him, no darkness, no ignorance. There's no darkness in God, as James tells us. And he is absolutely righteous. He is the one <clears throat> who does what is absolutely righteous. He is the one who wills what is absolutely righteous. And what he wills, uh, I can put it this way, even what he wills will happen is absolutely righteous. You know, I don't know, just, just as an aside, although connected to what I've just said, we do know that God is absolutely sovereign in everything that takes place. We do know that God has willed evil, and I've just told you everything God wills is absolutely righteous. So is it absolutely righteous that God wills evil? Well, the answer to that is yes, because it is good that God wills evil, that not he doesn't create the evil, but he uses the evil that exists, that has arisen from the creatures for his glory, and he works it all out together for his glory and for the good of his church. So. Yes, God is even absolutely righteous in what it is He has planned because He has planned everything that He has for good and righteous ends, which means He is absolutely righteous in so doing. So God is light, and since God is light, one who loves truth and one who loves absolute righteousness, those who would walk with Him must walk in that truth, must walk according to righteousness. John goes on to say that we can't walk in the dark in ignorance and in sin, and say that we're walking with God. Because if we do that, he says, we're lying. And we're not practicing the truth, no matter what we might think. So those who tell us that we can be Christians and simply receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, but never submit to Him as Lord, are wrong. We must submit to Him. We must walk with Him in the truth, walk with Him in the light. Otherwise, we're lying when we say we have fellowship with Him. The only ones who have fellowship with God are those who walk where God is, and that is in the light. Now, if we're walking in the light, if we're walking with God, John also told us there are certain benefits that we know are ours, and those settle the question of whether or not we are true believers. Again, we have fellowship with God. 
which means we have communion with Him through His Son. Eternal life is not just, you know, endless existence or endless existence in a place of bliss so that we don't have to endure the fires of hell. That's not all that's involved in it. Jesus defines eternal life in this way in John 17, 3. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. To know Jesus Christ or to know the only true God is to have communion and fellowship with Him. That is the true blessing of eternal life, to know Him, to be in an intimate relationship with Him, to have this communion with Him. So we can only have this communion with Him if we are walking in the light where He is. And if we do, then we know that we are saved because that is, Jesus says, eternal life. He also says we have fellowship with one another, which means brethren also who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's another reason why unity is so important. Unity of belief and of practice. We must all be walking in the light if we are to have fellowship with God and with one another. But he says, secondly, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. That atonement that Jesus Christ has made, we can know that if we're walking in the light, that that atonement was for us. That our sins have been forgiven. That His righteousness also has clothed us and we are made acceptable in the Beloved. In other words, we're just before God. We've been acquitted before God's um, judgment throne. We are justified by the righteousness of Christ imputed to us by faith. We can know that we will pass through the judgment of God on judgment day. And I hope that's something you want to know now that you will do. And you can know that if you're saved. Well, if you're walking with God in the light, walking according to truth, walking in righteousness, you can know Christ has cleansed you from your sins. You can know you will pass that judgment and that you are saved from hell and you are on your way to heaven. Now, we've seen that the only way that we can know these things is if we walk in the light. And, of course, we can only walk in the light if that's what we really want to do. And we can only really want to do that if the Spirit of God dwells in us because He is the one who gives us a love for the light. As we saw in Deuteronomy chapter 30, He has to circumcise our hearts. What that means in New Testament terms is He has to give us the new birth. What that also means is He imparts His nature to us. He gives us a love for holiness. In other words, He must regenerate us. We talk about regeneration preceding faith. That's an act of God, a sovereign act of God in which He he again imparts to us this new nature, opens our eyes, gives us a love for the Savior so that we embrace Him. What causes that? Is the Spirit of God producing this love of righteousness? And that's something He sovereignly does. I want to just, I want to kind of push that a little bit further each time we look at this. So I want to give you now a quote from W.G.T. Shedd with regard to God's sovereignty in this and how this regeneration, this new birth, actually gives us the ability to look to Christ in a saving way, which brings about everything we're looking at. This is what uh, Shedd writes, and I don't know if, if, if you're familiar with who W.G.T. Shedd was, but he was actually one of the uh, more high-profile, famous uh, systematic theologians that exist in the, in the, or existed in the history of, of the United States. He actually was a professor of systematic theology at Union Seminary in the 19th century. And again, that... Uh, you don't hear him spoken of very much in the South, I think. Although Union Seminary, I believe, was a Southern seminary. But this is what he writes. Man is passive in regeneration. He cannot actively originate spiritual life. His relation to regeneration or the new birth is that of a recipient. This is a part of the meaning of passivity in this connection. In that particular instant when the divine and holy life is implanted, the soul of man contributes no energy or efficiency of any kind, which means that he does nothing. He does nothing. It's sovereignly of God. Being dead in sin, the soul cannot produce life to righteousness. A corpse cannot originate animal life. Lazarus was passive at that point in time when his body was reanimated. The same is true of the soul of man in respect to regeneration. Man cannot cooperate in regeneration. This follows logically from the fact 
that he is passive in regeneration. A dead man cannot assist in his own resurrection. Something that, that It's something that God must do. We have no ability to bring it about. Now, the way the Spirit of God does this is through the Word of God. The Gospel is His instrument. It's the means by which He saves us. Let me give you another quote from a... Um, well, his name is J.H. Heidegger. And if, if any of you are aware of, uh, let's say, the history of philosophy, you'll know that there was a Martin Heidegger. I don't know if there was any connection between the two of them, who was a secular philosopher and uh, one that we don't want to listen to. This is not that Heidegger. This man was a 17th century Protestant scholastic. There was a time in the history of the church, I think set off by John Calvin. And we'll, I, and we'll get, well, Protestant scholasticism, that's another thing we should think about. But anyway, uh, where they really began to delve into the Word of God to try to understand, come to grips with what the Bible teaches and see the connection between all of those things as um, we do in this particular subject. What, what is it that causes faith in man that allows us or gives us the ability to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, they, they um, look into the issues. They see that, that the Scriptures teach us that it's the Spirit of God who does this. But how does He do it? When does he do it? Well, he does it through the preaching of the word. That is his instrument, through the gospel. Uh, this particular uh, scholastic wrote this, The word is the same which man preaches and which the spirit writes on the heart. There is strictly one calling, but its cause and medium is twofold. Instrumental, man preaching the word outwardly and the principle, the Holy Spirit writing it inwardly in his heart. That is what comes about in the new birth. The gospel is preached, the Spirit of God writes it on his heart, that gives him the ability to respond. Now this has to take place before anything else can take place. Before any of these changes that we're talking about in these evening messages will happen. But once it does, there's a whole package of changes that take place. Now, this evening we're going to look really at one more rather than two uh, of the things that will follow when the Spirit of God begins to work within our hearts. As John tells us in our text, by this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. That is, we become partakers of the Holy Spirit. But how do we know that we become partakers of the Spirit? Well, one of the ways by which we know is the way the Spirit of God works inside of us to produce what we might say are different um, subjective or internal experiences that we'll have. Changes in perspective that take place from within that will obviously have a profound effect on how we live and how we view things. It, it'll change the course of our lives. But we want to look a little bit more at what are some of those things that do change within besides the ones we've already seen as far as our perspective changing. Well, John tells us in this letter that there will be an internal witness of the Spirit confirming to our hearts the truth of God's Word, which is an extremely important one. And then one other one, which is also internal, how we view a particular truth in God's Word, but how it works itself out in our lives, that we will profess the truth regarding who Jesus Christ is. And we'll look a little bit more about that as we get to that particular point. Now again, first of all, John tells us that we may know that we are in Christ if we possess the Holy Spirit. But how can we know that we have Him? Now, there's a question, of course, um, to what John means in this text. Because he doesn't really specify how we can know that we, that we have the Spirit of God living within us. But there's really only two possibilities. It can either be inwardly or outwardly, either through an, a change in, in our experience, as I've said before, or something that happens outwardly that can be observed in our lives, which, of course, is connected to the inward change because the inward change generates that. As Jesus says to the Pharisees, don't just try to whitewash the outside of, of you know, this tomb that you have. I mean, basically, you're a tomb that's full of rottenness and dead bones inside, and you've cleaned up the outside to make it look beautiful, but the problem is still there. And that outside is just, it, it's just an external change. It's not a real change. He says, clean the inside out, and then the rest of it will become 
something that is beautiful, something that is glorifying to God. So the inward change will bring about that outward change. But what are some of these uh, inward changes that uh, John is referring to? Well, I want us to consider, first of all, the internal witness of the Spirit that he confirms to us the truth of God's Word, that it is true, that it, first of all it is God's Word and that it is true as, as, as well as giving to us a great love and desire for it. And we get that basically from chapter 2, verse 20. As I've said, we're going to look at a couple of different verses. You might want to turn there. In chapter 2, verse 20, John writes, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. Now, what does John mean by the fact that we have an anointing from the Holy One? Well, John doesn't actually explain what it is here, but I think it's clear from the rest of Scripture that what he's referring to in this same place is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the anointing that Jesus Christ has given to his church. Jesus said that it was necessary for him to leave, to go to heaven, before he could send the Comforter, the one who was going to take his place, the one who was going to minister to them in his absence. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit was already here. We do know that he was already ministering, but not to the degree that he would after Jesus left. And we see something of that, of that degree on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God actually was poured out and all of them were anointed with the Spirit of God and filled with him, with that same Spirit that Jesus was anointed with in his ministry. Remember how he was anointed with the Spirit above measure. The same thing that even those... Um, Old Testament typical anointings with oil. You know, what were those things referring to when the priest was anointed with oil, when all these different things were anointed? It was a reference to the work of the Holy Spirit. He is the author of holiness. He is the one who would equip the priest to do his work. He is the one that, that sanctifies. He's the one that sanctified the humanity of Jesus Christ and empowered him with this uh, this powerful and complete love of God and, and of holiness that enabled him to do the work which the Lord had called him to do. And this is the same spirit that Christ placed upon his church so that they would be equipped to do the same thing. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 21 and 22, Now he who establishes us with you is in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Every believer is anointed with the Spirit, and that is what John is referring to here. Now, John tells us in this passage that one way that we may know that we have the Spirit of God is through the result of this anointing, which is his work of confirming the truth. Again, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know well, what is it that they are all supposed to know if they have this anointing? Well, again, it has to do with the context of the letter of 1 John. Certainly, it is the gospel, but especially as it's opposed to the teaching of the false teachers and the Antichrist, because let's, let's read in context what John is referring to here, beginning in verse 18. He says, Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. So you see, what John is saying here is that I don't have to tell you that they're going out from them is because they were not really of the truth, because you have an anointing from the Holy One that bears witness to that truth already. You all know, and I'm writing to you because you do know, not because you're ignorant of these things. I made reference to a, a, a modern-day expositor of, of um, the scriptures last time, I.H. Uh, Marshall. He writes this regarding these two, regarding verses 19 and 20. 
Verse 19 has, in effect, indicated that the members of the church should recognize the falsity of the heretics and their teaching by the fact that they have left the church. Now verse 20 states that, in addition, they should know by virtue of their spiritual insight that what they taught was not the truth. So the Spirit of God has this, works within us this faculty of, of knowing the truth, knowing what is true and what is false. Now that's applied here to these false teachers, these antichrists, these heretics. And remember in the context, John is referring to basically this, um, what they consider to be a, a forerunner of the Gnostic view. The Gnostic view came from basically taking Greek philosophy and wedding it to Christian theology. The Greek philosophy that was in vogue at that time was a, uh, basically a, a dualistic philosophy that said that there's a principle of good in the world and there's a principle of evil. And these two principles are at war with one another and everything that happens is basically the result of that warfare. Well, what was good in their sight was everything spiritual. And everything evil was everything material. And what they were teaching was that Jesus Christ could not have become incarnate. That he could not have come in the flesh because God, who is absolutely good and holy, could never have, have polluted himself with the evil of the material world. And so they were denying that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And that, that's heresy. That's a soul damning doctrine. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ became a man, then there is basically no Messiah. There is no salvation because Christ had to become a man to save us. He had to do what we failed to do in the, in the covenant of works. He had to die on the cross to make an atonement for us. And just, just as Paul says, if Jesus was not raised from the dead, we would all be lost. We'd have no hope. If Jesus never came into the world as a man in the first place, there would be no hope for us. This is a very serious error. John writes, you know that because the Spirit who dwells in you bears witness to that. He confirms it even more in verse 27, again of chapter 2. As for you, the anointing which you received from Him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you, again, to teach you regarding this particular heresy in particular, because the Spirit of God is bearing witness to it, but as His anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in Him. The point being, again, that the Spirit of God bears witness to the truth in our hearts so that we might know that God's truth is His truth. Let me give you a few more scriptures. Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 2.12 Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 16, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. You see, the, the work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness to the truth. That is why John tells us that those who have the Spirit of God cannot remain in the dark. They cannot remain in darkness. They cannot continue to believe the lie. They can't continue to walk according to the lies of those false teachers because the Spirit of God has come to lead them into the light. He's the one who shows them the light, who illumines their minds so that they can see it clearly and their hearts so that they will desire it so that they might walk in it. If that is true, which of course it is because the Bible says it is, then every believer who has the Spirit of God must eventually come to the truth. That's one of the reasons why we, you know, it, it's really difficult to believe that, that, that believers, true believers who have the Spirit of God could continue to embrace and hold to things that patently are not biblical. Now, Obviously, there is an instrument the Spirit of God uses to bring them from where they're at to where they should be. And that's the Word. Somebody has to come to them, somebody has to teach them, or they have to read it in the Bible. They have to be exposed to that truth. But the Spirit of God will lead them to the truth. That is one of His offices, one of His works that He does within us to, to show us the truth, to give us the desire of the truth, to lead us into the truth. 
we will not remain in, in, the, in, in falsehood and in error. This, uh, by the way, is one of the reasons why uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith tells us that every believer can have an infallible assurance, not just of our salvation, which is what we're seeing, how that comes about through the study, but that the Bible is God's Word. Remember, there are many reasons why we believe the Bible to be God's Word. Again, the Spirit bears witness to the truth, but there are many other things. The fact that, uh, again, it's it's written over such a long period of time by so many different authors and it says one thing, the amazing consistency, the fulfilled prophecy, the miracles, there's all these things in the Bible that bear witness to the fact that it's more than just the writing of a man, that, that it's, it's, it has a supernatural author. But what is it that really gives us the absolute certainty that it is the Word of God? Well, it's the Spirit of God bearing witness to the truth. That is that subjective element that John says the true believer will have. If the Spirit of God is abiding in you, he will be bearing witness to this truth. If you can look at God's Word and, and have that firm conviction that this is the Word of God, and especially if you can see the glory of God in it, which is what makes it desirable to the Christian. If you love the Word of God, if you're seeking to walk in that Word, that is evidence that the Spirit of God lives in you. And if the Spirit of God lives in you, then what John says here is true. Uh, in Well, what John says is true of you. By this we know we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. You see the connection. If we, if we have the spirit of God, we abide in him and he in us. But we can know that we have the spirit by, this, by the fact that the spirit of God is leading us into the truth of God, that he is bearing witness in our hearts that this which is the Word of God is the Word of God. We have that conviction. So that's the first of these uh, uh, internal witnesses. But of course, I didn't want to just stop there because there's a more obvious one that we find in Scripture that is very internal and uh, one that we also ought to experience. And that we find in our um, uh, uh, meditation. In Romans chapter 8, uh, specifically in verses 15 through 17. Paul writes this, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we also, that we may also be glorified with him. Now several things are said in this text, but Paul goes a little bit beyond what John just says, that the Spirit does more than just bear witness to the truth and confirm to us that this is God's word and lead us into the truth and keeps us from error. He also has... Uh, well, he also does a work within us in which he confirms to us that we are the children of God. Now, not, not strangely, there's been a great deal of debate over what, exact, what, you know, what is Paul actually talking about here? What is this witness? Some say that it's the confidence the Spirit of God gives to us to call God our Father. That that is the uh, filial spirit, the spirit of adoption th that confirms to us that God is our Father and gives us that confidence. Others see it as simply a more direct and immediate witness to our souls by the Spirit of God that we are God's children. And really, if you stop and think about it, you really can't have one without the other. They both have to go together because what is it that gives us the confidence that we are the children of God? That gives us the confidence that when we say or cry out to God and we call Him Father, realizing what that means, we don't just say, God, help me, uh, but we say, Father. You know, we, we have this ability to call God our Father, that we have this relationship with Him, which is more than just the deity to His, to his followers, but it's one who is, is, is a, a Father to us, who loves His children, who cares for them, and who tells us we can come to Him and call Him by these very close and endearing terms. Where do we get the confidence to do that? 
except through the Spirit of God giving us that confidence. And that is the witness that he gives to us, the confidence to do this. David Brown of uh, the, the commentary, which is a classic commentary today called uh, the, the Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary on, on the, the Bible, uh, writes this, the testimony of our own spirit is born in that cry of conscious sonship, Abba, Father. But we are not therein alone. For the Holy Spirit within us, yes, even in that very cry which it is His to draw forth, sets His own distinct seal to ours. And thus, in the mouth of two witnesses, the thing is established. Uh, the, the, the testimony of our spirit that, that we call God our Father, plus the fact that the Spirit of God uh, sets His own distinct seal to it in drawing that out of our hearts. He says, there's two witnesses then, that we are in fact the children of God. And so this is another way in which the Spirit of God, uh, the, the evidence that He has a work within us, that, that we have not only the, you know, this, this uh, work of the Spirit to keep us from error, but also to give to us this uh, confidence that God is in fact our Father, that Jesus Christ is in fact our Lord and our brother and one who cares for us, that we are the heirs of God's kingdoms, joint, of, of His kingdom, joint heirs with Christ because we are uh, in this relationship with God. So this, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Obviously, both of these things should have a very profound impact on the way that we live. As far as what we believe, as far as how we live, and as far as the confidence that we have in our own Christian walk, um, knowing whether or not we are the Lord's people. Uh, those that really struggle with their assurance often have a very difficult time having any measure of peace, having any success in the Christian life. That question has to be settled or we can't really move on. Now there was one other thing that uh, John mentioned as a part of this that is both internal and external, and I want to deal with it just really quickly. And, and that is a particular fact regarding Jesus Christ that I've already made reference to. And that is the fact that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. One of the truths that the Spirit of God is going to lead us into is the fact that Jesus did, in fact, become incarnate. He did take upon Himself our nature. That thing which the, these proto-Gnostics, these people that were embracing some of this Greek philosophy uh, and who had denied the, you know, they were denying the humanity of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God will show us that that is false, that's a false doctrine, and will bring us to confess the truth that Jesus Christ has in fact come in the flesh. Look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. John writes, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. Now John again here is saying that if we have the Spirit of God within us, he will bring us to that conviction that that is true. Jesus did, in fact, become one with us. Okay? But secondly, we'll not only believe it, but of course we will confess it. And that was a very important confession in John's day because there were many who denied it. And how were they to know if they had the Spirit of God or the Spirit of the Antichrist? It's whether or not they believed this particular fact regarding Jesus Christ because to deny it was to deny everything that had to do with Christianity. Whatever you thought you had was not Christianity. Okay? The, the Gospel tells us that Jesus Christ did in fact become one with us, and if He did not, there is no Gospel at all. And so again, this is just one example, I think, of, of many things the Spirit of God will bring us to. That if we have the Spirit of God, we will, in fact, confess what the Bible says to be true. Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He has become incarnate. He has become one with us in order that He might save us. Uh, the unbeliever will deny this truth. Those who are not of the Lord will certainly uh, 
uh, deny it as these were denying it. Uh, one other thing we should think about too is it certainly is possible for a person who is unconverted to affirm God's truth. They can do that. A person who is unconverted can believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, but the one who denies it certainly can't. Okay, Certainly he can't. So there is something more that we need to consider here. We need to have more than just an intellectual knowledge. We have to have an embracing of what we know, of that truth. We have to respond to what we know. I think that's implied in what John is saying here. Same thing with what Paul says. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then, then you'll be saved. Does that mean if I intellectually assent to those things, that I'm necessarily a Christian because I happen to believe those things took place? There are many people who believe those things took place and who are not Christians. They're not walking with God. They're not walking in the light. All of these things have to be true, you see. You have to be walking in the light. You have to be embracing this truth as well as believing these things. But what John is saying is if you deny them, then you can certainly know that you are not a Christian, that you do not have the Spirit of God. So we do have to take all of these things into account. Well, wrapping all this up and applying it to ourselves this evening, we need to ask ourselves these questions. Do we believe God's truth? Is the Spirit of God leading us into the truth? Has He led us to the conviction of what we've even seen here, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? Do you, you, know, do you see the Spirit of God removing from your life those things that, that you may have believed in the past or maybe you're working through right now that, that aren't true? Is the Spirit of God leading you more and more into the truth of God? Has He given you the firm conviction that the Bible is His Word? And you see that it is, and you see that it's, this is different from all the other uh, religious literature of the world, you know, religious books in the world. This morning, uh, Kathy was teaching the little ones about this very thing. You know, how can we learn to love and obey God? Well, in, in the Bible alone, because it, is, it alone is His Word. All these other writings are the writings of man. Do you see that? Does the Spirit of God bear witness to that in your heart? Do you have the confidence to call God, the God of the universe, the God of creation, the one who sent His Son into the world, do you have the confidence to call Him your Father? Do you sense that relationship in your life that the, the Spirit of God says he, that, he is, that Christ is given to you if you've truly believed? The Spirit of God gives you that confidence. Do you have that this evening? And of course, again, do you believe all the elements of the Gospel? Not just that Christ has come in the flesh, but that He's done everything necessary to save you. He died on the cross to atone for your sins. That you cannot save yourself. You cannot uh, do anything to contribute to your salvation. That Christ has done it all. Do you believe that He's both God and man and the only way of salvation? And are you trusting in Him? If you have the Spirit of God, you will. But if you don't, you won't. So if these things are true of you, John is saying you can know you have the Spirit of God. And if you know that, you know that you abide in Him and He abides in you. But if you don't know that, if you can't see that, if you don't experience those things, then you don't have the Spirit of God and you need Christ. You need to repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ. You need to receive that, that new birth from above and that's something God sovereignly gives. So you need to seek it from Him. So what does your experience tell you? Well, whatever it tells you, let, it, let that conclusion direct you in, in the right path and the way you need to go and respond in, in the right way, the way that would, um, well, that would lead you into the truth. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to search our hearts uh, with regard to the things we've seen this evening.